I, I need to tell you a pastoral frustration. This preaching thing. It just seems like it interferes with life. Um, I get going the way I want to be and then kind of pulled back. So this morning, Bob and I are driving in uh, for church this morning, uh, about quarter to eight, and I come up from our house and there's a traffic signal. And I stop at it, which is a good thing to do. You know, it was red light and I'm sitting there and he's sitting there. We're sitting, and then I realized there are no cars going by. There's no cars anywhere. There's no pedestrians that we have to be careful for. We're just sitting there at a red light. Has that ever happened to you? Yeah. Well, I know you're much kinder than me. I, I was tempted to take the law into my own hands. I was, I was tempted to uh, rewrite the rules. And so just as I'm putting it into gear to run through, my friend Bob says, John, now what was it you're preaching on today? <laughs> I thought, well, we're in this series on the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience. <laughs> and that's just wrong. <laughs> you know, that is just so wrong. <laughs> Why today? This could have been, you know, take a risk for the Lord or something, you know, and then it would have fit with what I wanted to do. Anyway, so I sat there dutifully brooding, not patiently. I didn't sit patiently, but I brooded. And uh, But I, I started thinking about this, and uh, I, I don't know why it is, but it seems like every week when it comes time to get up and say, what's God have to say to us? Usually God's just talking to me. And this week in particular hit me because um, of all the fruit of the Spirit, the one that I um, have yet to fully experience, it's probably this one. So I'm going to be preaching to you today uh, about something that I, I know is true because it's in the Bible, but I'm a little late to the party on this one. And uh, it kind of goes against my, my natural instincts. Um, lately, I've been reading a lot of uh, business articles about companies and why their stocks do what they do and different things like that. And I was really intrigued because, uh, you know, McDonald's, uh, the hamburger place, not the aircraft place, there's a lot of research being done on why McDonald's is not growing and why they have uh, kind of leveled off on their year to year store business or anything. And they've decided, they've found out why. Because five years ago, you could place your order and get your crappy little burger in 48 seconds. That's the phrase fast food, right? Now, it takes almost a minute and a half to get your order. And they said, that's why McDonald's is not growing like it should. And then I started thinking, a uh, minute and a half is too long to wait. Nobody is caring about the crappy little burger that's probably bad for you and all those things. All they care about is this is going to take a minute and a half to get my lunch. And then I pictured myself sitting at that signal. Maybe for 30 seconds I was there. And I thought, yeah, they're right. That's why, that's why McDonald's is the way it is. So we have the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, and today, patience. And uh, it got me thinking about some things. Um, first of all, I looked at Jesus in the Gospels, and I gotta tell you, in my mind, he didn't seem very patient. Uh, he didn't take a minute and a half to wrap up the whips and drive people out of the church. You know, uh, it didn't take a minute and a half to tell Peter, get behind me, Satan. Uh, he was pretty, pretty quick. But I thought maybe if that's the case, maybe I don't understand what patience is. So I want us to look at a passage in uh, John chapter 11, one that you're very familiar with. Uh, the death of Lazarus, the um, one of Jesus' very best friends. 
Uh, I'll kind of skip down through the passage. But a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, a village of Mary and her sister Martha. And uh, when he heard this, Jesus said, The sickness will not end in death. It's for God's glory, so God's Son may be glorified through it. And Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. But when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. Then he said to the disciples, let's go back to Judea. Now, on his arrival, verse 17, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and people had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them, the loss of their brother. And when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus said, your brother will rise again. He said, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection of the last day. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And then it says, and after she uh, she said these things, she went back and called her sister Mary. The teacher's here. He's asking for you. And when Mary heard this, he got up quickly and went to him. And when Mary reached the place where Jesus was, she saw him and she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her were also weeping, and he was moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? Come and see, Lord. And Jesus wept. And then people said, Could he have opened the eyes of the blind man not have kept this one from dying? And Jesus, deeply moved, came to the tomb, there's a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. He said, take away the stone. And Martha said, Lord, he's been dead four days. My brother stinketh. That's the King James. <laughs> my brother stinketh. <laughs> I wanted to use that in my family. <laughs> then Jesus said, didn't I tell you if you believed you would see the glory of God? And took away the stone. And Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. Now, we know that passage, we've seen it in scripture, and sometimes we hear it in different ways. And so I've asked Bob to come and uh, sing that passage to us, uh, The Raising of Lazarus. One of my favorite songs that he's written. Come see someone deep 
story differently, don't we? It touches us a little bit differently. Now, Mary, Martha, frustrated. Why didn't Jesus come? If he would have been here, this wouldn't have happened. The disciples were frustrated because uh, they thought if they get over there, then something bad's going to happen. It was Peter said, why don't we just go then and die along with Lazarus? And uh, frustration brewing and brewing. Now, where's this patience? Because uh, I get this idea that patience is just, you know, we're sitting here and life's going on all around us and stuff, and we're just quietly, gently sitting there, smiling, kind of ignorant, you know, <laughs> and, but just kind of watching it all happen, and nothing gets to us. And then I, when I look deeper into the scripture, I realize that is exactly not biblical patience. In fact, uh, in uh, Psalm it's 37, Psalm 37, verse 7, uh, Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, uh, when they carry out wicked schemes. Don't fret about it. Just be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. So I looked up that word patiently uh, in the Hebrew, and I was shocked because I thought it meant, you know, come to church, sit here quietly, just wait for the Lord. But what it means is to turn in pain. Isn't that weird? That's what to wait patiently is, to be turning in pain and, and anguish. And it's the same uh, root word that you use for bearing children, child childbirth, where you're you're in your childbearing time and you're writhing in pain and you're waiting for the delivery of the baby and you can't make it stop and you can't make it happen and everything is just there and you're in pain. That is waiting patiently for the Lord. That is so different than just sitting back and watching stuff happen, right? And I think the issue comes down to what is it that we're going to care about? Because I have endless patience for stuff that I don't care about. <laughs> right? You know, you come to me, oh, John, we got to do this and stuff, and I don't really care. I don't give a rip. So I'm like, oh, well, let's just take our time with that. <laughs> you know? When we were kids, we'd go to our parents, we're agonizing over something, and they're going, well, let's give it some time. Well, that's because they're indifferent to us, right? And now we're indifferent. And so if we could just surround ourselves with indifference, we would come across pretty darn peaceful, wouldn't we? Except that's not what the Bible's talking about. What it's talking about is that you care so passionately and something matters so very much that you actually are agonizing as you wait for the fruition of it. As you're waiting for the Lord to intervene, you're waiting for God to, to show up and, and make a difference and it matters so much. Sometimes I try and be patient by just pulling back, hanging out. Get a good book, read it. Then I don't have to care. But I think God wants us to be engaged and caring and not indifferent. And there's a longing in that. And there's a struggle in that. And there's a pain in that. And that actually is the waiting patiently. In, in Psalm 40, we, we've talked about this a lot. Um, Damien's baptism verse. What does it say? I waited patiently. There's that word again. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the miry pit. It's a slimy bog. I waited patiently. I was agonizing in it. And yet, not taking my eyes off the Lord to come and, and deliver. Because there's something about... The agonizing weight that realizes we can't just make a difference, you know. 
I could solve my problem sitting at the traffic signal this morning. All I have to do is go through it. And if I get busted by our finest police officers and go to court, my defense would be that signal must have been broken. Felt like I was there for hours. Oh, Reverend, you can go. <laughs> in my dreams, that's what the judge says. You know. and, um, but in a way, it really didn't matter. Did it? It didn't matter. But some things really do. How do we wait patiently? How do we wait when we're surrounded with pain? In fact, I jotted down a we sing, we sing this a lot in church. The road marked with suffering, though there's pain in the offering. I think we forget sometimes that suffering and pain is the ordinary nature of life. And I tell myself, you know, John, you're going to be really patient when there's no more suffering or pain or struggle. You can be so patient when you're in your grave. John, I tell myself that. You don't have to tell me that. I tell myself that. And, and the thing is, I go, yeah, I could be patient for a long time then. But in the meantime, we're called to live. And we're called to live and care and love and move toward and wait for the Lord. Isn't that a tension? How do you care and love and hurt and suffer and pain and hope and wait for the Lord? I'd like to think that if we have a relationship with Christ, we've accepted Jesus into our lives, we're following him, we're part of a wonderful church family, everything's super, then we can just wait for the Lord without any struggle. Like so many of you experience, right? You, know, you have trouble-free lives. I don't know. We're in the struggle because we care, because it matters, because life really matters. So we should struggle in it. The weird thing is, you know what the Hebrew word is for, for waiting patiently? Patient? It's so weird. Cool. Uh, like when we say, oh, it's cool. Everything's cool. And we take it as being, it's easy. It's a breeze, right? But when they say it's cool, that means they're writhing in pain as they wait for the Lord to show up. So the next time someone says, how are you doing? You say, oh, it's cool. <laughs> and they'll go, oh, great, you're writhing in pain, waiting for the Lord. Yes, I am. Right? I am. Now, I think this issue of substituting the idea of patience with the idea of indifference has caused us a great disservice. Because for so many years, I believe that, you know, if I'm patient, then I'm not suffering. I'm not in agony. I'm just patient. I'm indifferent. And so what's happened is we, we've actually encouraged each other and trained each other to stop caring deeply. One way to get around feeling uh, tension and struggle and frustration in sharing the gospel with people in our family, our friends, our neighborhood, or other places in the world, introducing them to Jesus, if we could just not care about it, it stopped being a problem for us. Do you notice that? And uh, if we stop caring about people in need, we go, well, you know, they got their issues, you know. They're probably happier that way, you know. Uh, or like when David was like 10, my dad took him aside to give him the talk on why, sla why slavery was good, benefits of slavery. <laughs> and, uh, you know, everybody had a roof over their shack, and uh, they all had beans to eat, rice, so they were happier. And David's going, Dad, Grandpa's telling me crazy stuff. <laughs> I go, yes, that's why he's our crazy grandfather. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, but if we just stop caring, if we withdraw, if we put a little barrier between us and others, between us and the world around us, between us and 
scripture, put a barrier around scripture, wouldn't that help? Then we don't have to care, and we could come across as the most patient, easygoing folk around. What would we be missing if we did that? We'd miss out on life. That's what we'd miss. We'd miss out on life, and we'd miss out on depth. We'd miss out on character. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? What is it that causes you to turn in agony? What is it that causes you to go, I don't know if I can hang on much longer on this. What is it that causes you to go, Lord, come soon? I think that's a prayer we need to be praying more. Lord, come soon. It doesn't mean that we're restless. It means that we're aware that only the presence of the living God and his salvation can make a difference that matters in the situations of our life that matter, that really matter. Now, uh, years and years ago, one of my favorite authors, uh, John Westfall, <laughs> uh, it's a really old book, so you even got wrinkles in it. Coloring Outside the Lines. Okay, so I was looking at this the other day, and this is a story you probably all know. I want to share it with you. Um, having lived a few years in the jungles of Africa, I guess it was natural that I would be drawn to Tarzan movies on Saturday afternoons. Tarzan was a hero for me as he swung through the trees solving problems and battling wrongs. The movies invariably included a scene in which a villain veers off the trail and wanders into the clearing where there's a pit of quicksand. Inevitably, he calls for help. No one's able to rescue him. The more he thrashes and struggles to free himself from the terrible ooze, the deeper into the pit he sinks until all that's left is a pith helmet floating on the surface of the swamp. <laughs> Imagine the impact these scenes had on me. I began to carry a long stick when I went out to play in Whittier, California. I was diligent in my search for dangerous places in the backyard where quicksand might be lurking. It wasn't until a few years later that I learned how the suction of quicksand increases when you struggle to get free. To keep from sinking, you need only to resist the natural urge to struggle and instead spread your arms wide, tilt back your head, and float on the surface. You will not sink as you wait to be rescued. But try convincing a little kid that she shouldn't fight to get out of quicksand. Try convincing an adult that they need to not struggle when they find themselves in the pits of life. It goes against our natural tendencies. When we're in desperate situations, when relationships are crumbling, our jobs are going down the drain, our finances are in disarray, our marriages seem dull and listless, our natural urge is to struggle. We will try, do, or promise anything just to make something happen. But the more we kick against the darkness, the deeper into the pit we sink. Now, how do we go against our natural inclinations? It's not by denying the pain. It's not by denying the agony that we're in. It's not by forgetting the hope. It's by spreading our arms and looking up, and we don't sink. Now, you know what's really ironic? This is this drove me crazy. Two weeks ago, Damien called me from the hospital where he was and said, Dad, I just learned a really important thing. My therapist there took me aside and told me about quicksand and told me how you sink when you fight it, but that if you put your arms out and put your head back, you won't sink. Dad, have you ever thought of that? <laughs> well, what the heck? <laughs> Read the book, kid. <laughs> uh, and I feel like we don't deny the pain, we don't deny the struggle, but what we do is we say, okay, Lord, come soon. <laughs> I need you. Lord, come soon. And we wait patiently, sometimes in agony, sometimes right, but we wait with our arms spread and our heads back, and we go, Lord, come soon. There's a word for that in the New Testament. It's actually two words. Maran Atha. Maran Atha. Maran Atha. Which uh, means, Lord, come soon. And 
And actually, because of the idiosyncrasies of Greek, it means the Lord is come. Lord comes soon. He's here and he's coming. Oh. To close our service today, I want us to think about that and make that our prayer. In whatever situation you're in, whatever situation you will soon be in, anything you've been going through, I want you to picture that and make your prayer. Maranatha, Lord comes soon. Be here. Be here. I need you. I live in hope for you. And I wait patiently for you. So I'll ask Bob to close our service with uh, singing the song he wrote. What are you waiting for? Whatever it is, you can put your arms wide, your head back, and say, Lord, come soon. Make that your prayer.
I need you. Lord, come soon. So now go in the peace and the love and the care of the God who knows you, who made you, who calls you by name, who gives everything for you, and will come at the right time to be for you what you need him to be. Bless you. Amen. Amen.